Hello, everybody. My name is Leah, and I am a TA here at LSAT Unplugged. I teach reading comprehension on Monday evenings. So if you haven't joined us yet, I do highly recommend that you do. And I am here this evening interviewing Elizabeth Madigan, who is an Associate Director of Admissions at Brooklyn Law School. She joined the office in 2016 after working at the international tax practice of Ernest & Young. Prior to that, she was a prosecutor at the Bronx County District Attorney's Office. She re received her JD from Card Cardozo School of Law and her MB and her BA, excuse me, in math and music from Williams College. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Hi, Leah. It's a pleasure. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. We're excited for you to share your knowledge with us in hopes that it can make us a notch above the rest on our law school applications this coming cycle. So can you give us a little bit of background, maybe a little bit more in depth of what led you to admissions? Yeah, um, you know, I always like to say, so my first job out of law school, as you said, I worked at the DA's office in the Bronx and um, it was an amazing experience. I grew so much. Um, I learned so much. I saw so much. Um, I did so much. Um, <laughs> things that I really loved about that role, um, meeting new people every day, hearing their stories, um, helping them, um, figuring out what exactly is needed, navigating different systems, um, is, is what I really loved. Um, so what I love about this role that I have now, you know, I've been, this is my sixth or seventh cycle now at Brooklyn Law is I get to do all of those things that I just said, um, you know, without frankly, all the, the trauma and the depressing stories that go along with obviously working in the DA's office. So I really love that I get to speak with, um, not just admitted students, but prospective students, prospective applicants, um, People I meet in different undergrads that don't even end up going to law school, but I helped them figure out that maybe law school wasn't right for them. Um, I'm so excited when I talk to freshmen. Uh, you know, I'm just excited to speak to people at every kind of stage in the process um, and do, like I said, exactly what I did at the DA's office, but obviously at a very different setting, meeting people at, you know, maybe the most hopeful time of their lives. So um, it's, it's been a lot of fun and um, I, I really enjoy it. Yes, I'm sure it's much more lighthearted. And I can say as someone, you know, who's a TA at Elsa Unplugged, one of, I think, the greatest parts of that job is getting to see over time how the students grow, right? Yeah. And so I'm sure that you enjoy the same part about your job um, as you go through admissions. So yeah, you know, I've what? been doing for, oh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> No, 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 you go. It's okay. Yeah, no, now that I've been doing it for a while, you know, I've seen people when I met them, you know, in undergrad and then they ended up matriculating at BLS and then now they're alumni and yeah, they're like my little children growing up it's in the same way that you, you get to see progress as well. So it's, it, yeah, it's really cool. Right. So what do you think has been the most challenging and the most rewarding aspect of being an admissions officer? Challenging is, um, you know, I wish I could admit every person I that I like, um, you know, um, it's hard to, um, it's hard to, at the end of the day, still be in a way, you know, having to judge people um, and, you know, decide on people based on documentary evidence. That's, that's really, um, it's the hard part. I don't like denying people. I don't like waitlisting people. Um, I wish I could admit, as I said, everybody that, you know, comes to meet with me. Um, but sorry, did you say hardest and most rewarding or what was, what was the other one? Yes. <laughs> rewarding is, yeah, like I said, um, seeing people really grow through the process. If I'm lucky enough to have somebody that I met, um, you know, a year or two ago, and then now they're applying and then, you know, they end up being my admitted student at, at Brooklyn Law. We um, each are kind of assigned to an admitted student. So every admitted student has a counselor within our office. So if they're my admitted student, um, you know, or sometimes I'll admit somebody that I met and I'll tell our administrators, make sure I'm their counselor. You know, I want to see them through this process. Um, so that's really exciting. And then, you know, I get to see them 
be on moot court and journals and end up doing, you know, having their dream job. Um, and then I have them come back and do panels for other admitted student events. Um, so, you know, I've been doing it long enough now that, you know, that kind of cycle, I'm, I'm seeing the cycle to its end, which as I said, is the best part. Absolutely. 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 And I'm sure that it's so nice. I know from a student's perspective to have someone that, you know, an individual that they're comfortable with through this whole process, because I'm sure, you know, as you know, and many others know, it can be incredibly stressful at times. So I think having someone that you're comfortable there, there with you, you know, along the way is comforting in those times that feel to have an elevated level of stress. So that's awesome that you get to be there. That full circle moment yeah. is like the best, right? Yeah, definitely. So what are, what are some factors that play a role in acceptances and decisions? Well, you know, every law school is different, but to some extent, every law school, I think, um, is looking for in general, the two same things. Um, you know, we like to say we look for students that can succeed academically um, and that will contribute to our community. Um, so, you know, that's that's really kind of our our guiding you know principles. Um, we can go into specific components and all of that. And how do we know if somebody might succeed academically or how do we know if they'll contribute to the community? And happy to talk you know, more in depth about that. But, um, you know, as I said, every law school, I think, goes about it with those two guiding principles, but it's different because every law school has a different community. So something that we might look for at BLS to make sure that you're a good fit, you know, might be different if you're applying to, you know, a different school. Um, their community and their um, field might be very different. So um, there's no one right law school for everybody. I'm sorry, there's, it's not that every law school is right for everybody. There's more likely one or a few law schools that kind of fit, you know, what you're looking for and then, you know, that, that you will fit their community as well. Sure. And you have the floor if you want to go more in depth. I know that you, that you mentioned, um, you know, you have the floor to go ahead and do so if you want to at this yeah. time. And then I can just ask questions based on what you say, yeah, <laughs> what yeah, you sure. have to say. Sure, sure. So, um, so, you know, how do we know, how does an admissions committee know that, you know, you're going to succeed academically or we don't, know. it's all prediction, right? It's all using the facts that we have to make the best guess as to will you succeed in law school? Law school is a very unique kind of animal academically. Um, you know, you know the, the classroom environment is very unique. It's different from undergrad. It's different from MBA programs. Um, so, you know, as I said, it's prediction to some extent. Um, so. Obviously we look at transcripts, um, not at Brooklyn, it's not just GPA. We really look at your transcript um, and any undergrad schools you attended and graduate work you've done. Um, we don't just look at your GPA, as I said, we look at majors, we look at minors. Did you challenge yourself? Did your grades go up over time? Did they go down over time? Um, did you do really well, but you had one bad year, whether it's your first year or your third year or one bad semester and it seems uncharacteristic, if you did, it's dragging down your cumulative GPA. So if I see that, you know, I think, gee, I hope this applicant submitted an addendum to explain what happened that year. And that's something that I recommend every applicant do. If, you know, you have a situation like that. Could be illness. It could be a family circumstance. It could be COVID, you know, whatever it is. It could be a major that you uh, didn't like at first. You know, they said, what if your first year was really poor? Maybe you started off in a major, but then you switched and then you did really, really well. Um, so all of those things give us a sense as to your academic potential. Um, and um, the other big thing is definitely letters of recommendation. So if you're still in, in undergrad or a year or two out of undergrad, you know, we really want to see academic letters of recommendation. So um, letters that come from professors. Um, if you're still in school and we don't see letters that come from professors, you know, it makes me think on the admissions committee, well, you didn't have a strong enough relationship with a professor for you know that professor to be able to write you a letter of recommendation and you're still in school so there's at least i don't know three or four semester uh professors each semester and then you had them last you know you had another three or four last semester so you should be able to come up with you know 
one or two good letters of recommendation. So, you know, we really look at letters of recommendation as well, especially if they're academic, obviously, you know, a professor can give us a good indication of how you do in the classroom. Um, and then the last big component I would say that speaks to your academic potential um, is the uh, personal statement. You know, the personal statement, um, and we can talk about that in a lot of detail, um, but in terms of what I'm talking about right now is your writing sample. You know, it gives us a sense of how you put a thought together, um, your understanding of spelling, grammar, syntax, um, you know, flows of ideas. Um, you know, it, it, it shows us how you think. Um, so it gives us, as I said, hopefully a sense of, you know, how strong of a thinker you are. Um, and the last thing I should definitely say is kind of a thing I should say, but with a footnote is, you know, the LSAT. Um, and the LSAT is definitely controversial, um, whether or not it predicts law school success, 1L success, bar success, yes to no to varying degrees. But yes, we look at your LSAT score as well. Um, the, you know, it's, it's one of the good indicators of, of bar exam success. So obviously we wanna make sure you're gonna pass the bar. So all of those things go into, will you succeed in the classroom? Now, the next component, um, are you a good fit? Will you contribute to the community? Um, so as I said, at, at Brooklyn Law, um, that's something that's huge to us. Um, we really want students that are gonna be active in the life of the community. We don't want students to just go to school and go home. Um, you know, our student community, whether it's student organizations, pro bono projects, clinics, um, um, you know, uh, honor societies, they do so much um, that is, really a part of how our students get jobs, how they make connections, how they um, get published, you know, whatever it is, um, how they support one another, both during and after law school. So how do we know that? Um, a lot of times, you know, we look to your resume. Your resume is kind of the best indicator of, you know, potential to contribute to our community. Um, and I'm very passionate about the resume because I think that everybody gives it a short shrift. And when I say that, um, you know, I'm on the other end, you're kind of on the front end of law school applications, I'm on the back end. So when I see resumes, they tend in my experience to have been edited the least. And, um, you know, I, I find that personally offensive. No, I'm joking, but you know, I, I just find that it's such a big missed opportunity um, because as I said, your resume should be full of great things that show us what you're doing with your time. Um, do not give it short shrift, really pay attention to it and think about the message that you're sending about yourself as an applicant and as a participant in your community, whether it's through internships, um, through campus involvement, volunteer work, religious work, um, Working three jobs while you're, you know, paying your way through undergrad, um, you know, whatever it is, if you're really passionate about, um, you know, music as I was, then I want to see your resume full of music things. It does not need to be legal. But as I said, that gives us a sense of how much you want to be invested in the life of the campus. Um, so that's another big thing. Well, one thing that I want to touch on specifically well, there's a lot, but yeah, one of the lot. first things is <laughs> one of the first things is the resume. Mm -hmm. And I think, in my opinion, at least what my resume and I think many others showcase is what you're passionate about, right? Like volunteer work, what you chose to spend your time doing. And I feel as though there's typically a trend there, right? Um, like for, for me, it was women's organizations helping them. I worked with Pennsylvania Women Work, which was an organization that helps women, you know, be emerging into the workforce or merging into the workforce or changing occupations. And obviously I that I'm in the position where I'm just entering my career, right? Yeah. Is entering law school. So I'm almost not even there yet, right? <laughs> so for me, I I wanted to learn while also helping out and being a part of it. Um, yeah. But again, they all kind of follow that same trend. And so I think you're right that a lot of people will discount the resume thinking that it's just like, okay, well, this is what I use to apply to this and this and this, and we'll just yeah. send it. So I really like that you touched on that because a lot of, to be honest, a lot of the interviews that we do 
you know, the resume, I don't think anyone puts as much emphasis on it. Um, I know, and, you know, detail. <laughs> yeah. And it actually is probably one of the most interesting things, right? Yeah. Um, you probably learned the most from the resume because it's a compilation of different parts, right? So yeah. I really like that you that you pay attention to that. I, I'm happy to hear that. Um, oh my gosh, there was something else. It'll probably come to me as we <laughs> keep talking, but I figure that I'll talk about um, tips when writing, you know, admissions essays, personal statements, diversity statements, addenda, anything specifically um, that maybe you look for in those as an esteemed officer. I know that that's always something that applicants like to like to hear about as they start their storytelling. Yeah, I know, I know it's, you know, that's why I left it. I, I knew we would probably talk about, you know, essays in particular. Um, it's definitely something that I think people ask the most questions about. Um, I, I get those, I'm sure you get those, um, because it's definitely the most vulnerable. You know, a test is a test, you can study for it, but it's not face-to-face. -face. You don't have to really share your thoughts on anything. Um, resume as well, you can kind of craft what you want to craft, um, you know, for, put forth the image that you want to put forth. Um, at the end of the day, it's just really a couple job descriptions, right? But the essay is, is vulnerable. Um, it's, you know, again, show me how you think, show me what's important to you. Um, and that's, you know, that takes a lot of thinking, um, especially so at our school, our prompt is very open. You can write about literally anything. Some schools require you to write about why you want to go to law school. Some require you to write um, about why you want to go to that particular law school. Um, I think those are actually a little bit easier. Um, at least you're given a prompt, you know? Um, for sure. law schools that like ours that let you write about anything, you know, how do you choose one thing to write about? Two pages, double space. Um, certainly we're all far more interesting and complex than two pages double space. Um, and so it's really hard to pick one thing. Um, so the general advice I want to start with is pick one thing. Um, it's really, really hard, but we know that you're so much more than that. Um, so don't worry that, you know, we'll think if you write about, um, you know, the street you grew up on, that we won't also know all the amazing things you did in undergrad. Make sure the rest of your application tells that story, your resume, your letters of recommendation, your transcripts. Um, use this as an opportunity, I would say, um, to tell us what's not in the rest of your application. Obviously, you know, big pet peeve of, of every admissions officer or even job you apply to, right? That we say, don't make the cover letter just a summary of the resume, right? So don't make the personal statement a summary of the resume and the transcript. Um, so pick one thing um, and just a tip, you know, when I was applying to law school long, long time ago, I remember thinking the same thing, how do I pick one thing? So I actually wrote a couple different essays um, about completely different things. Um, you know, I had a, a more than one thing about me that I wanted to share. Um, and I sent them around to people that really knew me well. And I said, you know, what do you, what do you guys think? Which one? And I didn't ask the question this way, but they all came back with the same response. This was close fam a family and a few close friends. Right? They all came back with the same response. They all came back with the same essay. And they all said, this one is the, um, is, sounds the most like you. Um, and, you know, that's some advice that I always give to people. I had a couple different essays because um, some schools let you submit additional essays. Um, it might fit the prompt for one school and not, and not another. So you can always use that essay somewhere else. Um, and if not, it's still helping you hone and, you know, craft that perfect personal statement, even if you have to throw two or three in the trash. Um, so I think that's, um, if I may say so, really good advice of my own. Um, <laughs> but I recommend people do that if they feel stuck kind of picking one. Um, so pick one topic is the other thing I kind of keep going back to. So if you want to write about, you know, kind of a journey or a story, that's fine, but it should really tell, you know, culminate towards one topic. Um, you want this to be an essay. Two pages double space is not that long. So it shouldn't be, a, you know, it shouldn't be a journey to read. Um, it should be concise and coherent and um, doesn't need to tell us everything amazing about you. 
the rest of your application is what's that is what that is for it should let us get a sense of who you are how you think um, are you funny then you know write in a funny manner are you really formal then write in a really formal manner um so let it reflect who you are the best essays are not necessarily the best because of their content they're the best because i'll tell the admissions committee um content was fairly generic but you know, I can really get a sense of this person's kind of personal voice. Nobody else could have written this essay. Um, so really think about not kind of formalizing it to the extent that your personality disappears. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, um, as I said, pick one thing. And if it's not about why you want to go to law school, please, 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 please do not, you know, finish with a paragraph. And now that's why I'm applying to Brooklyn Law School because you know that street I grew up on brings me here. Um, if it's not about law school and you don't have to write about law school, don't make it about law school. And that's completely fine. It shows a lot of confidence, in fact, um, in your actual essay topic. Um, do not try to pander. Do not try to give the admissions committee what you think we want to hear. We've read it all um, and we can really see through that kind of thing. Um, so that's personal statement. Okay, um, diversity statement, a lot of the same thing applies. Um, a lot of schools offer you the option to write a diversity statement, so you don't have to. Um, but if you want to, again, pick, you know, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of different components uh, of their diversity and that's great, but try to make it cohesive. Um, try to really have an overarching theme. And remember, it's optional, so, um, quality over quantity don't submit an essay just to submit an essay i say submit an essay if there's really something else that you want us to know about you if you have a really compelling story that you want to tell that speaks to the diversity that you would bring onto campus that's great i cannot wait to read it um but make sure you don't just do it for the sake of doing it the last thing addenda um addenda should be short and sweet and to the point they are not essays. Um, an addendum can explain, as I said earlier, for example, uh, one particularly poor semester, or if you took the LSAT a few times um, and you didn't get the, the score you wanted the first time or the last time, um, or what else? Yeah, I guess those are the two main, oh, or character and fitness, obviously, there's something you wanna explain. Addenda are meant, I, I think of them as uh, kind of a roadmap that an applicant can provide a file reader, you know, um, hey, I'm sure you saw that this one semester was really bad, but let me tell you why, you explain why, end of story. You don't need to justify it or tell a story, tell the story that you need to tell to explain what happened, and then that's it. Um, and what else? So a few things I want to tie back. Um, I remembered what I wanted to tell you awesome. <laughs> and what I wanted to comment on from before is that I think it's really refreshing and a little bit of nerves to hear that the admissions committee does look at everything, right? They look at all these things that this isn't just a surface level, like, okay, this was the GPA, this was the LSAT score, this is this, right? Like, this is where they went. It's really refreshing to hear that you do look into all of that, right? I know as someone who I did not have the same major my whole time in undergrad, and my first major, I was not good at it. And I stuck with it for entirely too long and was the reason that, you know, my GPA was what it was. Yeah. You know, I changed my major and had a 4.0 the whole time after that, yeah. right? But obviously my cumulative GPA still held on to my previous major, yeah. which was something that really concerned me as an applicant thinking that, okay, at this point, point in the cycle they're just gonna boop 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 down the list of what my credentials are and say mm, do I really want to look into this or not so I appreciate that you you know want to look into all of that and you want to see and you want to know more and you want an explanation about things because I think sometimes whether it be true or not depending on the school you know students are worried that that's just not the case and speaking from experience I know that that's something that I was worried about whenever I was applying to law school. So 
thank you for being an individual on behalf of all of us <laughs> who looks at everything when making a decision. Otherwise, you know, a computer would be doing my job. But and I can't speak for every law school, but at least at our law school, a lot of law schools, um, yeah, we're looking at everything. But if you're worried somebody might miss, you know, that, oh, okay, Leah switched majors and then look how well she did. That's what the addendum is for. You know, give us that roadmap. Maybe somebody won't look that closely. So um, show them where you want them to look. So a question on the agenda. What is your recommended? I have a lot of students ask me how long their agenda should be, whether it's, you know, one paragraph, two paragraphs, maybe three paragraphs max. Like, is it supposed to be a page long? What is your sweet spot, do you say? Yeah, so it listen, it depends what you're explaining, right? right. Um, I think a few sentences is fine. A, a regular size, you know, half a page, double spaced paragraph can usually explain a situation like you just explained. Um, or if it's an LSAT kind of, oh, but I, you know, the, the test was taken under conditions that aren't whatever, whatever. Also probably just a half a page is, is more than enough. If it's a more involved character and fitness issue, um, you know, two paragraphs you might need and you might want to say, you know, I, how you've grown or whatever it is that you want to explain. But otherwise, as I said, just, just explain it. You don't need to justify it. Just a few sentences on what happened. Stick to the facts. Perfect. Well, do you think that a well-written admissions essay, you know, all of the things that we just talked about, makes up for maybe a lower LSAT score than what the school is particularly looking for? And if not, is there something that does make up for that? I mean, easy answer is yes, um, definitely. So, you know, we evaluate, and this is generally true for most law schools. Obviously, every law school is different, but, you know, every law school will tell you that they evaluate applications on a holistic basis. That's the word everybody uses. It means they, you know, every component matters. Um, we really mean that. So um, yes, you know, if I read a file and the, let's say the LSAT and the cumulative GPA are both, let's say above our 75th percentiles, um, but I read the personal statement and I don't think you can write, I will not admit you and vice versa. Let's say that your scores are somewhat concerning, um, you know, they're below our 25th percentiles, let's say, not sure if you could succeed academically based on the numbers on the transcript. But then I read your, let's say, addendum and it explains that you were, let's say, working three jobs during undergrad. I read your letters of recommendation and they speak to your academic potential, your amazing work ethic, your quality, amazing qualities as a person. And I read your personal statement and I see that, wow, you can really write and you can really think at a high, involved, thoughtful level. Um, I will absolutely recommend you for admission um, to the admissions committee. And we regularly admit people, um, you know, whose scores may have been concerning. But like I said, you know, maybe you went to, maybe you went to undergrad a long time ago. It's not really, you know, your doesn't represent your academic potential. Um, and, you know, in my answer, I kind of also answered your other side questions is, you know, every component matters. Um, I once read an application that was stellar. Um, but then I read in, in every way, everything was great. But then I read the letters of recommendation, which I tend to read last, and they were horrible. Um, both the choice of recommender and the content were just, you know, really made me question that person's judgment. And I did not admit that person. So, so everything really matters. Different things can make up for different concerns. Um, Well, that's great to hear, um, you know, that it's not a, as I said before, it's not almost like checking a box, right? Like they yeah. did it or they didn't and it's a yes or it's a no. It's, it's good to hear that it's not like that. Um, so how early do you think an applicant should consider preparing for admission? So I generally say, well, first, you know, uh, let's back up. I say you need to be really, really sure that you want to go to law school. Um, you know, that's part of preparing for admission. You know, are you sure that law school is what you want to do in terms of graduate school, in terms of um, which type of graduate school? Um, 
and we can talk all, all about that as well. But let's say you're certain and you want to go to law school. What I say is you should kind of reverse engineer, um, you know, starting from the deadlines of, let's say, your top choice schools. So for us, we don't have a deadline. We offer rolling admissions, but we have kind of a priority deadline of February 1st. So work backwards as just an, as an example from February 1st. First thing you want to really pay attention to is the LSAT because the LSAT or, you know, the GRE, whatever test you're taking. Um, but in most cases, it's the LSAT and um, it's only offered a certain number of times per year, right? So, so you want to allow yourself, oh, I don't know what advice, you know, you guys technically give, but uh, what I generally say is you want to allow yourself two to three times to take it. Um, most people take it, you know, around two to three times. Um, and that's totally fine. Don't be worried about taking it more than once. Um, if you take it, you know, I always say if you take it, you know, six, seven, eight times, I'm going to raise an eyebrow. I'm going to see, you know, did you take time to study between those, those uh, administrations? But generally, you want to allow yourself, I say, two to three times. And then, so you want to think, you know, okay, if I want to get my application by February 1st, my last LSAT's going to be January. So let's say I want to take another one in November and I want to take my first one in September, let's say. This is an example. Um, but then you want to make sure, you know, will I have time to study? You know, it's really a, not a full-time job, but it's, it's, a, it's a, at least a part-time job to study for the LSAT. So um, for sure. yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> for better, sure. <laughs> right. So, right. you know, will yeah. I have time? If not, okay. If you're working or you're in school, okay, then maybe allow yourself more than just two months between each administration. Right. So maybe you need to start, um, you know, the summer or the spring before for your first LSAT. So that's what I say, you know, the LSAT controls everything because it's the timing. Once you take your LSAT or at least know when you're taking it, you can write a personal statement during those many months. You can ask for letters of recommendation. You can do all that other stuff. I'm sorry, you broke up there on the last part. Will you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Just I just, the last part. Yeah. Once you That's I okay. figure out, once you figure out, you know, um, the timing of your LSATs and what makes sense with your life and um, your ability, you know, don't just take the LSAT to see, um, cause that score is something we're gonna see. Um, so once you make sure that you can take it and know when you can take it, that's kind of gives you the roadmap for what your timing will be. I like your answer of it being a reverse, you know, going yeah. in reverse and terms of deadlines I think that's really smart I, for me personally uh, I was like it was like shotgun yeah <laughs> shotgun LSAT apply to law school that's common too that's common too all, all really fast at the end of the <laughs> admission cycle right and luckily it worked out for me but I always like as someone who's going to be starting law school you know in like two weeks I think oh, I so can't exciting. help but think to myself, what if, like, what if I, <laughs> oh, yes, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'll be going to Duquesne University oh, in amazing. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congrats. yeah, yeah, thank you. I got a scholarship, so I cannot, I cannot not complain, but I think to myself, you know, had I have done this and been maybe a little bit more prepared or done a little bit more research or, or you know, taking the time, right, instead of taking some time off, right, after I graduated to just be a little bit quicker about my plan of action, you know, how diff would I be going somewhere different? Would I not? Like, would the situation be the same? So I like your idea of reverse engineering of the whole process of like going back and spacing your LSATs out. You know, I didn't have the ability to really space them out far, right? And I think to myself, how much better I could have done had I had a whole other month in between, right? Instead of one month, it was yeah. two months in between. So I think that's really great advice as someone, you know, who just went through the application process that I could totally agree. And if there was anything that I I could, any advice I could give to my students in terms of that is, you know, giving yourself ample amounts of time, depending on your situation, right? Like I wasn't working and I studied for the LSAT full time, but I understand that a lot of people, you know, can't do that. Um, you know, I kind of did that and took a year off. So I wouldn't have to study for the LSAT while I was in school and while I was working, um, just so that I, 
you could give it my focus. And obviously that situation is different for, for everyone. So I read that answer. I yeah. Um, agree. You know, I, I should say the answer I gave is like best case scenario, right? Assuming you're, you're on it early enough and you have that time and it, you know, you if know. you don't and you are, you know, applying later in the cycle, um, you know, it could work to your advantage. You need to be strategic. I think about, you know, what oh, schools what? are still accepting applications at that time. Um, sometimes schools will give more scholarship at that time if they want to get to a certain place in their class. Um, you know, I, you know I, from working on an admissions committee, I know some schools do that. Um, so definitely not at a disadvantage. I should, I should just say, yeah, my original answer is if you have yeah. all the time in the world and you're trying to be super prepared and you're like still an undergrad or law school is far off, or if you, I should say also, if it's, if there's a specific law school that you know you really want to go to. Right. So just based off of what you said there, you know, are, is the law school still accepting applications? Should a student be nervous? to reach out to an admissions office, you know, maybe with a question like that, maybe they're applying late or, you know, it could be about anything, right? Is there anything in particular that I should know? Is there almost maybe a student prying for information that maybe, you know, they want to try and hone in on in their application? Do you encourage students to reach to admissions committee to ask those questions? I know that a lot I always say before, if I could add in my own little answer to that question <laughs> is to like, look at the admissions website to make sure that your answer isn't on the admissions website before you email or call and ask them a question that you already have the answer to. That's my one like pet peeve. But in the event that that question is not on the website, <laughs> do you encourage students to reach out? Yeah, no. Um, so yes, definitely. Um, and again, you know, every law school might be different, but to some extent, I think most law schools will at least tell you what I'm, what I'm about to tell you. And at least we really mean it, um, is that, uh, yeah, reach out, um, you know, to some extent what I, what we do is, um, I mean, it's reductive, but customer service, you know, we're here to answer your questions and we know it's a really scary process and it could be scary for some people, um, you know, you don't know if you should be overly formal. Some people are overly informal. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we receive so many emails of all kind of coming from all different types of places, asking all different types of questions. In a lot of cases, yes, the question that they ask is on our website, but, um, you know, the times when I'm answering our general email line, I don't get upset because I know that these students are, um, looking at so many different school websites. Um, the information might be even different on a, on one school on one page versus another, and then there's another school and, you know, it's okay. It's an overwhelming process. And my job is not just to say yes or no to applicants. As I told you before, I see it as really helping people figure out if law school is right for them, how to apply to law school, if Brooklyn law school is right for them. If not, you know, that's okay. I hope that in my working with them, um, they realize that another law school is a better fit. That's a success too, because they wouldn't have been good at Brooklyn Law and they're gonna be great somewhere else and they're gonna be a great lawyer out there in the world, which is all I really want. So yes, please ask any question that you have. Of course, you should try to do the research, but it's okay if you haven't. Um, we really wanna stay in touch. And if you're looking for you know, information about, are you still accepting applicants? Um, we're very honest about it. Um, you know, right now uh, we're slowing down because our class is pretty much full. Um, but if you emailed a month or two ago, maybe I would have said, you know, yes, we are, but at a very, we are admitting students, but at a very slow rate, get your application immediately if you're interested. Um, so we're very transparent, like I said, um, if it helps you, it helps us. We want educated applicants out there. Um, so please don't be shy. Thank you for that. Well, I have to ask, and we've kind of talked about this right fit, right? Right fit for this school, right fit for this school. Is there a right fit for law school in general? Is there a right fit student for law school? I know that we talked about how that can depend and vary on, you know, Brooklyn law or elsewhere, but is there a right fit for law school in general, do you think? Um, you know, it's funny, I've never been asked that question, um, but the first thing that pops in my mind is definitely not. Um, 
And that's one of the really exciting things about my job and about when I was a law student. Um, it takes all kinds, right? Um, you know, we want people that, I mean, it's reflected in every part of our kind of decision making. Um, you know, we always say, we, I don't care what your major was. Um, I don't care what your minor was. If, like I said, if you're interested in music, if you're interested in dance, I want to see all the dance that you did. That's great. If you're an extrovert and you know you're going to do moot court and mock trial and you're going to be a litigator and you're going to, you know, go work in the U.S. Attorney's Office yeah. when you grow up out of law school, um, that's great. If you're a shyer person and um, you want to work on contracts all day, we know that we need those people too. I mean, the world needs those people too. Um, so we want all skills, talents. You like math, great. You don't like math, great. Um, you know, you are interested in technology. There's, you know, definitely a niche, a couple niches for you there. If you're not interested in technology, a lot of the legal field still hasn't advanced either. So, so um, you know, law touches every part of life. It does everything. Um, and as I said, we need all different types of lawyers. Um, if you came from a big city, if you came from a small town, um, if you grew up with a family of lawyers, if you grew up with no lawyer, these are all different perspectives um, that we really want on our campus. And as I said, we really want out there in the legal field. So there's no right or wrong applicant um, to law school. I love that. And I think that one misconception that some people have is that like everyone wants to go and do like criminal law, right? That everyone wants to go and do everyone that goes to law school, like wants to do the same thing. And that's so not true. I was on a zoom. Gosh, it was months ago now. Um, but it was after, you know, Oh, I was admitted and it was just a bunch of admitted students meeting with faculty on Zoom. And one of the faculty members was like, oh, you know, all of us lawyers are introverted. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, well, that's most certainly not me. <laughs> I'm most certainly not yeah. introverted. So I appreciate that you said, you know, some people... And some people are introverted and some people are extroverted. And I think it all has to do with like the career that you want to have, right? Like you, you don't have to have one or the other. You get to pick and choose what you want to do. Yeah, that's, that's my story. So I went into law school knowing I wanted to work in criminal law. Um, I took one tax law class and I fell in love with it. Um, and I ended up working in criminal law. Um, but then when I was decided to, you know, to, to leave that field, um, I went to work at Ernst & Young um, doing tax and um, you know, it's a position that technically I wasn't hired. You, you can't actually work as a lawyer under different regulatory um, guidelines at an accounting firm, at a tax firm. You can't work as a lawyer. It's uh, based on a big scandal a few years ago, uh, many years ago. Um, but so, you know, you're hired as a whatever it is, but I can't do actual legal work. Um, but having a law degree helped me get the position that I got, helped me get the salary that I got. Um, it helped me work my way into the controversy group where I was working on litigation with the IRS. Um, and in my role now, frankly, you don't need to be a lawyer to do what I'm doing, but definitely helps. Again, it sure helped me get the position, helped me get the salary, and it helps me obviously be educated and be able to speak to prospective students about what the law school experience is like. So yeah, there are so many different roles out there um, for people with a law degree that aren't what you traditionally think of as being a lawyer. Absolutely, absolutely. So do you have any thoughts or predictions on this upcoming admission cycle? I know that there was a little bit of an influx or so we've heard an influx in applications do around, you know, like after COVID, during COVID. Um, and I've heard statistics that they've gone down or this year there was a lot of people, a lot of applicants, I should say, and that they're predicting it'll go down. What are your thoughts on this next cycle? Yeah, so um, last year, which was 2021, what? was a blockbuster year for us, for every law school. Um, this year, applications are lower than they were last year, but still above uh, what they were in 2020, 2019. Um, it was, it's frankly impossible to match or beat last year um, in terms of application <laughs> volume. Um, but, you know, still, still pretty strong, but obviously a dip from 2021. Um, and then indicators for this coming cycle, so 2023, 
uh, show that it might be a little bit of a downturn from this year. Um, indicators like, you know, how many people are applying are going to be taking the summer LSAT um, is generally one of the things that we look at. Um, and those numbers are not very high. So yeah, it might continue to slip a little bit next year, um, which is good, good for applicants. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you have any admissions tips for maybe some non-traditional students, those who are returning after taking a few years to work, um, maybe those students looking to transfer after their first year of law school. I know this question kind of encompasses a lot. Um, and, you know, if you want to break that into sections, you absolutely can't. Yeah. So um, for, for students that have been out of school for a few years, um, uh, I, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, you know, whenever I, not whenever, but a lot of times when uh, I, you know, meet with those students or when I get asked questions, it's that. It's, you know, uh, how am I going to be seen? You know, I'm yeah. older. I have been out of school for a while. Are you going to look at my work experience? Are you going to look at my grad school? Um, you know, and the answer to all of that is um, don't worry. And yes. Um, you know, we're so excited. As I said, you know, it, it takes all kinds. We meet applicants um, in the context in which we receive them. So if you are fresh out of undergrad, if you're still an undergrad and applying, you know, we want to see all the amazing things that you do on campus. Um, if you're 10 years out of undergrad, that's fine. That's great. Uh, what have you been doing in those 10 years? I want to see an amazing tenure, or not 10 years, resume shouldn't go 10 years back, but, you know, I want to see the amazing things you've been doing in the last few years of your life. Um, hopefully that's a career you have going, or um, did you take the time off to raise your family? That's amazing too, you know? Um, so don't feel, I think, insecure is the best like, advice I can give. Um, understand that whatever you bring that you feel is different, is actually an asset. Um, diversity, diver diversity, diversity. We look for so many different types of people and different experiences. And if you were, you know, spending the last three years raising your child, write your personal statement about that. You know, I want to hear all about that. Um, that's a, a great perspective that, you know, frankly, a lot of our campus doesn't have. Um, and I want to hear about that. And, you know, so if you're older, if you've been out of school, try to not think of those things as weaknesses, try to turn them on their head and understand that you bring to our campus what almost nobody else can. Um, and try to, you know, kind of turn them into strengths because they are. Um, you know, I always encourage students to, prospective students to see um, themselves as their first client and, you know, the application as their first case. So sell yourself, you know, if you think something is a, is a negative, well, you know, opposing counsel is going to tear you up for it. So why don't you preempt that and, you know, make that, turn that into a positive. Um, so that's for, you know, non-traditional students, I should say. Um, for transfer students, we look at all the same things that we looked at, you know, when you were applying, that we would have looked at when you were applying as a 1L. So everything, academic potential, um, and fit in our community or, and how active you are in our community. But we have an additional kind of data point, right? Because now we're gonna see your first year of law school grades. And um, that can definitely make up for a, you know, if we looked at your application as a 1L and we didn't admit you, and maybe we made a mistake. You know, maybe we look at your grades wherever you ended up going and you got all A's, that's amazing. We'll recognize our mistake. Uh, you know, we'll say, you know, we, we really had your academic potential wrong here. Um, so, you know, you want to just look at it the same exact way. Um, you want to sell yourself. You want to write definitely a new personal statement. If you're applying to a school that you applied to originally and didn't get in or chose not to attend and you're reapplying now as a transfer, um, we want to see a new personal statement. And that's true if you're just reapplying, not as a transfer. If you applied one year and then didn't get in or got in, didn't want to go, and then you decide law school is right for you two years later, make sure the personal statement's different. Um, so that's the same, same thing goes for a transfer. Um, but yeah, otherwise we're looking for all the same things that you can succeed and that you're going to contribute to our community. And again, another additional data point for that is going to be your resume, we want to see that you're really involved on your law school campus. Um, so that just helps get a, helps us get a sense of, you know, what you're going to do, hopefully, on our campus. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much for all of you know the answers and insight that you gave us on editing and story crafting and all things admissions is there anything that you would like to touch on before we wrap up here um you know i i like that a lot of what we talked about i i feel is kind of so personal you know should students um be afraid to contact admissions should students feel uh that they are at a disadvantage if they're out of school for a few years um you know should students or how long should a personal statement be or an addendum be you know I can tell that you're yeah. asking questions that the people ask because they're scared. Um, and so I'm, I hope that, um, you know, the biggest message I, I can send that I've tried to send inadvertently, but now that I think about everything I said um, is, you know, don't be scared. Um, everybody's in the same boat. Um, even if, you know, somebody was a paralegal for like five years before law school, once you get to the law school classroom, nobody is at an advantage. Um, nobody is at a disadvantage. You're all in the same field, as I said, playing field rather. As I said, law school is a unique animal. Nobody's seen anything like it before. When you get there, everybody's going to feel like they were thrown into the deep end of the pool. Um, so try to stay calm and um, focus on the things that, that you can actually focus on. So if you're you know, in your senior year or you've already graduated, you can't do anything about your GPA. It's over. That's baked into the cake already, right? So don't stress about it. Think about how to craft your application to tell a story. Let's say you didn't like what you did in undergrad in terms of your performance. You know, think about what story you want to tell. Probably that's a good personal statement. You know, whatever passion you had in undergrad maybe wasn't for you and, you know, whatever. Um, or, or make sure that your personal statement is a great example of writing because maybe I'm maybe concerned I'm. about your academic potential. Um, make sure that your letters of recommendation can make me say, oh, no, no, this person will do really well despite the transcript. So, you know, understand what you might think of as weaknesses, but really try to use them as jumping off points for, you know, the ultimate picture of yourself that you want to paint. Um, and what else is in your control? Obviously, the LSAT. That is a learnable test. Um, if you're here, if you're watching this, you're here because you believe that already. And that's great. You know, that's really proactive. So, um, yeah, don't, I would say, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, try and really sell yourself and make every application, each component of the application as strong as it can. And don't be afraid to reach out to us. As I said before, we're not scary. A lot of people that you meet in admissions are just like me. Well, I don't think I'm scary. Uh, I mean, maybe, you know, sometimes, but, <laughs> but um, you know, we want to help you. As I said, we want you to be more educated. It's better for you. It's better for us. It's better for law schools and lawyers out there. So um, try not to get bogged down in a lot of the noise and things you read online. Um, at the end of the day, it's you and your strengths and the specific questions that you have um, that you can easily get answered. Just reach out to admissions. If they don't have the answer, they won't give you the answer. It's not a big deal. Your name is not being written down anywhere as someone to deny. That's not how it works. So hope I can provide at least a little sense of um, uh, not calm, but maybe relief into kind of how we work on an admissions committee. Sure. Well, thank you so much again, Elizabeth. Should any of our students have any more questions or anything, any questions specifically about Brooklyn Law, how can they reach you? Yes. Um, so you can always reach out to, you know, as I said, our general email line, it's admitq, A-D-M-I-T-Q at brooklaw.edu. Um, but please, please reach out to me directly. Um, my email is my first name, Elizabeth, dot my first, my last name, Madigan. Um, at brooklaw.edu, B-R-O-O-K-L-A-W.edu, um, with anything, questions about the application process, Brooklyn Law, um, you know, if it's next year, next month, um, just any time, I'm always happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Well, thank you so much again, Elizabeth, for your time and your expertise. I'm sure that it will be a great help to to all of our students and we wish you the best in your future as an admissions officer and once again thank you so much from all of us here at LSAT Unplugged.
Yeah, thank you, Leah. It was really a pleasure. It's always a pleasure talking to, to you know, Steve and his team. Um, and uh, I wish you so much luck. It's really, really exciting. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your evening. You too. Bye-bye.